evening, I want us to continue with our study of a general introduction to the Bible. We are well over a year in this study. I looked it up. We started last year in August, all right? And with that in mind, um, my goal is to end this study by the end of October. Now, that's the goal, all right? And, and uh, um, we have a few more things to cover concerning this topic. For the sake of our visitor, um, we have been studying this topic, a general uh, introduction to the Bible. Really, the, the reason for studying is we, we want to understand how we got the Bible, right? This book that we have here. In this study, we're learning the processes that, that God used providentially to bring about the Bible, right? We know that the Bible did not fall from heaven, uh, leather bound, written in English <laughs> for us to read. It went through a process and it, it, a process that started from the mind of God. And so in this study, we're answering that question. How did we get the Bible? And it's a very important question to know the answer to because there are people who attack the authenticity of the Bible. People that bring claim against the Bible as it not being the word of God or as it being uh, the effort of some few men that decided to write up and make up all this stuff you read about in the Bible, all right? Now, any good, any good Bible student will dive in to understand uh, uh, how we got the Bible and, and will use that knowledge and that uh, uh, insight gained from that research to defend uh, the Bible or to defend the truth. Um, I wanted to use this time to reacclimate us in this study because it's been five weeks since we talked about this subject uh, due to guest speakers, due to me going on vacation and, and, and various reasons. So, so I want to use tonight uh, to reacclimate us uh, in regards to this study. I want to start off with what the Barna Research Group came up with in regards to the United States and the people that they have taken in as the sample size for their research. Uh, they did a survey on what people think or the beliefs of adults in the U.S., their beliefs about the Bible. And in looking at this survey, 26% of the people will say this, the Bible is the actual word of God and should be taken literally word for word, all right? Now, I agree with the first part of that statement. The Bible is the actual word of God. It, it came from God himself. Second Timothy 3 and verse 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. What I don't agree with is the latter part. It should be taken literally word for word. There are things in the Bible that are under the umbrella of figures of speech. You got to consider uh, the different genres in the Bible. The Bible is written in various genres. You have history, you have poetry, you have, uh, you know, um, you, you, you have law, the language of law. You have wisdom literature, the, the different categories of genres that are used in the scriptures. That's important to consider. Uh, take, for example, when Jesus said, if your eye causes you to stumble, what did he say to do? Pluck it out, right? Now, I, I have had occasions where my eyes have caused me to stumble, and you can see I still have two of my eyes. I didn't literally take a fork and pluck it out. It's not meant to be taken literally, right? It's a figure of speech. It's a metaphor. It's designed to, to give an impact. And in that, in that uh, uh, context, 
Jesus is saying, you need to do your best to stay away from temptation. And that's the idea. If, if, if you're easily tempted through your eyes, well, don't set yourself up for failure. Don't put yourself in a situation to be tempted through your eyes. All right? And that's the idea. So, so that first part, only the first part we agree with, but not the rest of it. There are some things that we need to take literally. Like when Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. He literally means that, that we should do that. And love your neighbor as yourself. We need to take that literally, right? So there are some things to be taken literally, but then there are some things that are figurative in nature. Notice the second group, 29% say the Bible is the inspired word of God and has no errors, although some verses are meant to be symbolic rather than literally. Now, I agree with that 100% with that whole statement. That's pretty accurate. Right? That's 29%. It is the inspired word of God and has no errors. There is not a single valid contradiction in the Bible. There are alleged contradictions that people bring up, usually by the enemies of scriptures. All right? They'll bring up these alleged contradictions. Take, for example, someone might say, well, God says in the Ten Commandments, do not kill. But in 1 Samuel 15, if you read that chapter, he commanded Saul, the king, to kill everyone. So now you have a contradiction, right? God says, do not kill. And here he is commanding Saul to kill everyone in the, in the, uh, among the Amalekites. So, so now we have a contradiction. If you don't know your Bible, then you might say, that is a contradiction. Or if you don't know the meaning of the Ten Commandments when it says, thou shalt not kill, and the implications behind that meaning, right? When God says, thou shalt not kill, he means thou shalt not murder, right? In malice and forethought, take another person's life, right? Um, murder is different. From here's a here's a, a a thing that happens in life. Sometimes people negligently do something that leads to another person dying, and not that's not necessarily murder, is it? That's why we have these different degrees in our criminal justice system: first degree murder, and you go down the list, right? So the Bible is the perfect word of God. There are no errors in it, and we believe that. 15% say this. The Bible is, in, is the inspired word of God, but has some factual and historical errors. Right? So the great creator, the supreme being who knows everything, who created everything, he made some mistakes writing his book, the Bible. That's the accusation here. The Bible has no mistakes in it. Someone might make an argument about the variances that are in the manuscripts. That's different. All right. The Bible has no mistakes in it. Uh, take, for example, um, geographically, the, the uh, uh, city of Jerusalem is seated on elevation and and. When someone is traveling south, and the Bible would describe them traveling south, when you travel south, in our understanding sometimes when we're reading the map, when someone is traveling south, we might say they're going where? They're going down, right? or they're traveling down on the map. When the Bible speaks of someone traveling south, going to Jerusalem, it says they're going up to Jerusalem. And that's not a geographic error. That's actually pretty accurate. You may be traveling south on the map, but Jerusalem is elevated. They're traveling up to Jerusalem. Right, that's one of the examples there. 9% say 
say this, the Bible is not inspired by God, but tells how the writers of the Bible understood the ways and principles of God. If the Bible is not inspired by God, I would say, throw away your Bible, go eat, drink, and live your life however you want to live it. I will tell that to you. But the Bible is inspired by God. And the words are binding. It's the life guide for us. The psalmist said in Psalm 119, verse 105, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. God has given his inspired word to guide us. So, so 9% say it's not. All right. Now, I don't know what the sample size was or the number of this population. But isn't the United States population somewhere close to 400 million? Is that right? Say again. 330 million people. What's 9% of that? Our math, math uh, gurus. What was that, Rob? Around 30 million. That's a lot of people. So, so we see the need to... That's not adults. Okay, so, so Ralph gives a rough estimate. That's, that's still millions of people. 9%. Of the United States population. Again, I don't know how many people they surveyed, but let's say they took the entire population. All right. Yes, sir. Oh, oh, yes, yeah. The uh, racial wise, uh, the city of Honolulu, Metro Honolulu, has nine hundred thousand people. That's from Hawaii Kai past the airport. That's a lot of people. 9% of that, that's a, that's a lot of people that just don't know their Bible. 13% right. say the Bible is just another book of teachings writing, uh, written by people that contain stories and advice. Now, the Bible contains stories. The Bible contains great advice. But it is not the product of just men. The people that wrote the word of God, they were led by the spirit of God. So in other words, they wrote God's word. It's not something they came up with themselves. Hence, again, through, through the lens of this research, we want to emphasize or magnify the need to know how the Bible came to be, to know that story. Because you'll run into someone who fall into these percentages, who may say something like, the Bible is not the word of God. Well, excuse me, but I, I beg to differ. The Bible is the word of God, and here's the evidence for it. To understand the question, we, we have been studying these four, well, we've covered two of them, but these are the four main things that we want to understand to properly answer that question, how we got the Bible. Inspiration has to do with who wrote the Bible. All right. And and ultimately the answer to that is God. Second Peter 1, um, verse 20, verse 19, 20, and onward, right? That that uh no prophecy of scripture came by uh, private interpretation of man. But holy men of God spoke or spake as they were moved by the Spirit of God. Holy men of God wrote as they were moved by the Spirit of God. Ultimately, we studied that. The answer to that is, is um, God himself through the different people he inspired or he led. We'll talk more about it. We talked about canonization. Which books belong to the Bible? Why aren't there a thousand books that make up the Bible? Why is it that it's only 66 books? Why do some Bibles have extra books known as the apocryphal books? So that co that's covered under canonization. 
and we already discussed that. Uh, number three, uh, this is what we're currently studying, is transmission. Has it been accurately preserved, right? Uh, should we be concerned about, you know, the Bible we have? Is it reliable? Do we have in our English language uh, the words and the meaning behind what God intended to say? And then finally, there's translation. Has it been accurately translated from the original language, Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic? Has it been translated accurately from those languages to our language, to our English language? And that would be the last part of that study. Uh, more on inspiration. So just to refresh our minds on several of the quotes from the resources that uh, I've used for the study. Um, one of the resources is the book by Geisler and Nix with that title, A General Introduction to the Bible. And I quote uh, this from them. Inspiration is the process by which spirit moved writers recorded God-breathed writings. That's the meaning of, of inspiration uh, as worded by uh, Geisler and Nix. We read that, that scripture already of 2 Timothy 3 and verse 16 where you have that Greek word that's translated as inspiration, the Greek word theonoustos. It's a compound word. You have theos, God, and pneuma uh, in there, the root word pneuma. Uh, meaning breath. So the, theonoustos means God breathed. That's what inspiration is. And so I like that definition by Geisler and Nick and Nix. It's the process by which spirit moved writers recorded God breathed writings or God breathed words. Um, Mosier, one of my mentors at the school, he wrote uh, uh, a book about. Um, how we got the Bible in his book is one of the resources. It's titled The Book God Breathed. And he said this as, as a definition for inspiration. God's influence on the mind of man to enable him to speak or write God's word. All right. And then we have the example there uh, written by Peter here. Second Peter 1, verse 20 and 21. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of men or of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Right? So what we have in the writings in the pages of our Bible are God's word. Now, when we say inspired by God, it's not just the words the context in which the words are used, the grammar uh, um, in, 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 in those contexts, the symbols used in the scriptures. Yes, the commas, the periods, the, all those things are inspired by God. Jesus said it this way, right? Not one jot nor tittle will pass from the word of God until all is fulfilled. The Apostle Paul made an I'll come to you, Pat. The Apostle Paul made an argument from the plural tense to the singular. He 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 said in uh, Galatians chapter three uh, that God spoke to Abraham not as to seeds, plural, but as to seed, singular. All right, he's talking about the promise: uh, all nations will be blessed by your seed, not seeds. Right? And so, so everything about the Bible, the words, the grammar, the punctuation, or properly put, the accents in the original language, inspired by God. Go ahead, Pat. In the canonization portion, how did they go about including or excluding what book? to be there? Did they do a vote or on it, or did they analyze all this manuscript and all that? That brings us to the second part, right? Canonization. That This answers your question, Pat. 
Uh, we talked about canonization. It has to do with which books belong uh, to the Bible. Another related question is, why are there only 66 books? Um, one of the principles that we, we wanted to drill in our minds is this. God determines the canon, not man, right? No person or persons um, decided that, well, this will be Bible, this will be not, right? or not be Bible. Um, take, for example, in history, there are several councils that have been held discussing things like, canonization. Well, the, the council there, one of them is the Council of, of Trent and the Council of Hippo in 397 um, AD. One of those councils, what they actually did is they just recognized the need for collecting the books and putting them all together. That's what those councils did. Those councils never decided which is Bible and which is not. And the reason being is because you have a community of people way before those councils that have already collected the books. Who are those people? The New Testament Christians. right? The people that received the original letters. The churches in Ephesus. Uh, all the churches mentioned in the New Testament. Those people, and then go even further, the Old Testament people. They have already collected the books when Jesus met with those disciples on the road to Emmaus. He mentioned to them the collection and he, he, he confirmed with them. Go there with me to Luke chapter 24 in your Bible. This, this was first century before any council came out in existence. Right, so you got to remember that. All right. Luke 24. Uh, notice with me, uh, beginning in verse 44, Luke 24, beginning in verse 44. Um, well, let's 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 back up and and start from verse 36. Let's start from the meeting. Right now, as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, peace be to you. When they were terrified and frightened and supposed they had seen a spirit. He said to them, why are you troubled? And why do you, why do doubts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. But while they still did not believe for joy uh, and marveled, he said to them, have you any food here? So they gave him a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled, listen to this, which were written in the law of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. The law of Moses. Does that sound like they had a collection of it? Yes. All right. Then he says, which were written in the law of Moses, and, um, um, the prophets, so that's the minor prophets, the major prophets. Um, sometimes we forget Ezra and Nehemiah, Ma, uh, Ezra and Nehemiah, uh, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel. Those are all prophets. Moses was a prophet. All right, Joshua, a prophet, Elijah. So all the writings in connection to the prophet sounds like they already collected it. Jesus referencing it and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. All right. And so no council decided on the canon of scripture. The community of God's people have already received the books that they already had, the Old Testament that was already available, they already believed that that was God breathed. Now, what the councils did, uh, 397 with the Council of Trent, um, later on with the Council of Hippo, what that did is it brought 
the 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 various collection together, all right, uh, so that they had this canon of scriptures, sixty six books, and then later on the apocrypha was added by some communities as part of the canon. Should not be part of the canon. But let's remember that, right? In regards to uh, Pat's question, you know, who decided that what book would be part of the canon of scripture? God determined that. And it was already decided by the community of believers using the principles we discussed, right? So here are the five principles they use. Was the book written by a prophet of God, right? If the author of the book was Moses, then that's already a, cri uh, a criteria met. It was written by a prophet of God. Moses was a prophet of God who wrote Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Uh, was the writer confirmed by an acts of God? We're using Moses as, in our, as our example. Was Moses confirmed by acts of God? Yes. Turned the, the, uh, turn the Nile into blood. The frog plagues, the various plagues that came upon Egypt. That was God working through Moses. He was confirmed by acts of God. The parting of the Red Sea. There was not a single Israelite that crossed that Red Sea that didn't believe Moses was a prophet. And that's about close to 3 million people crossing that Red Sea. Right, so think about that. This community of people believe Moses was prophet of God. He was confirmed by acts of God through the miracles that he performed. He wrote the truth about God. That's the third principle. Did the message tell the truth about God? All right. One of the dead giveaways of false prophets today, there's so many today, is the fact that they say they are a prophet of God. They may deceive you through their video editing on YouTube and whatnot. They may deceive you uh, uh, that they have some power of God, but you pay close attention to what they are saying. Because the dead giveaway is they will always say something that's not biblical. That is not attached to the truth that we have in scripture. It didn't tell the truth about God. Number four, did it come with the power of God? Hebrews chapter four and verse 12. For the word of the Lord is sharp. It's alive. It's, it quickens. Sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing to the dividing of soul and spirit and of the joints of marrow. And it is the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The word of God has the power to convict a person. It has the power to encourage a person. It has the power to convert a person. That's what is meant here. All right. There are a lot of spiritual books written by spiritual people. That sometimes when you read it, don't have the spiritual power that the word of God has. All right. And, and sometimes we have to protect ourselves against that. Right. Who are we quoting? Now, I, I love, I, I, don't get me wrong. I, I love to quote great speakers. I love a good, I, I love a good quote. But I know that that's what it is. It's a quote. The scripture, on the other hand, that has the power of God. That's why it's the seed. Luke chapter eight and Luke chapter eight and verse eleven. The seed that we plant. It's not our words, because our words don't have the power. The seed that we plant is the word of. God, and that's why that's the seed in the parable of the sower. It is the word of God. It has that power of God attached to it. Uh, God even said through the writings of Isaiah that my word will not return to me void. That when he sends out his word, it will accomplish the thing of which he sent it out for. So it will not return to him Void. Every time the word of God is preached, there are two things that happen. 
One is acceptance. The other is rejection. When people reject the word of God, that's that's part of, of, of it coming back to God. It's the truth. Some people just won't accept it. And the word of God will cut in their hearts. Kind of like those that we read about in the book of Acts. Some of them, their hearts were free. Some of them, their hearts were cut. And it's a different reception. Some received it. Some rejected it. Right? But does it come with the power of God? That was a test. There were so many apocryphal mm -hmm. books that just didn't have that aspect to it, that edifying power to the story being told, because a lot of them were more of like legends and fairy tale type of stories. And then last but not least, was it, it, was it accept, accepted by the people of God, the original audience, right? When God gave Moses the Ten Commandments uh, uh, originally. Now, I'm, I'm talking about the time when he rewrote the Ten Commandments because when he came down from the mountain, he shattered the tablets that God gave him because the people were worshiping an idol. And so God said to him, take, take stone and write on, on it again. Now, when Moses gave them those words, did anybody say, well, Moses, I don't agree with you. I don't accept that book that you were. Moses, I don't accept those tablets of stones in your hand. Where did you get that, Moses? Whose word is on that, Moses? They never did that. Right? Why, why didn't they? Because they knew Moses was a prophet of God. They had just witnessed the miracles performed by God. That day, 3,000 of them were killed for worshiping an idol. The message told the truth about God. It came with the power of God and it was accepted by the people of God. The letters of the New Testament are the same way. Paul in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 37, Paul said uh, to the Corinthians, if anyone is a prophet, let him acknowledge that the things that I write to you are the commandments of God. And you know what the church in Corinth did? They said, you know what? I don't believe this letter is from the Apostle Paul. No, they didn't have a problem accepting it. They accepted it because the words of, an, of the Apostle Paul was raw. It was demonstrated before them. We talk about inspiration. We talk about canonization. These were the principles used to eliminate the false books that are still out there. This is why there are only 66 books in the true canon of the scriptures without the apocryphal books uh, that are in some Bibles uh, today. Now, the third thing, and this is where we are at in our study, is transmission. And it has to do with that. Has it been accurately preserved? Um, I read these already, but we are getting reacclimated. So that our next class will go right into where we left off. All right. So again, the quote from Geisler and Nix, page 321 of their book. And I quote, there are four links in the chain from God to us. Inspiration, canonization, transmission, and translation. In the first, God gave the message to the prophets who received and recorded it. Canonization, the second link, dealt with the recognition and collection of the prophetic writings. In effect, the objective disclosure was complete when the 66 books of the Bible were written and then recognized by their original readers. However, in order, to, in order for succeeding generations to share in this revelation, the scriptures had to be copied, translated, recopied and retranslated. This process not only provided the scriptures for other nations, but for other generations as well. The third link is known as transmission of the Bible. All right, we sang a song today, more about Jesus. More, more about Jesus. I want to know more about 
Jesus. That would have been impossible today without the process of transmission. Right? Because the Hebrew had to be translated and copied. And those translations had to be retranslated and recopied. That's the idea of transmission. One of the main things about transmission that I want us to always remember is that it had to be written. It was always God's will to write the Bible down or to write his word. Another way of saying it, it was always God's will for me to stand here today and have this Bible in my hand. Right? That was always his will. It wasn't like God decided, well, you know what? The whisperings uh, through the dreams and the visions, the burning bush and the tablets, me speaking from heaven, that's not working. So let me decide to write it down. It was never that way. God had always intended for the word to be written. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 and verse 2, well, let me read that statement. The scriptures had to be written because God was going to stop communicating in the ways he has communicated in the past. What do I mean? What ways? Well, here's what the Hebrew writer says. God, who at various times in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken unto us through his son, through Jesus, right? Uh, through his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the world. There was a time in history, during the biblical times, when God spoke in various ways. To Abraham, he spoke directly to Moses he spoke from a burning bush right? to to the priest he spoke through the Urim and Thummim there were various ways God spoke through to Balaam he spoke through a donkey all right various ways now God doesn't do that today does he all right. Those of you who have pets, have your pet preached to you lately? He doesn't do that today. He's not in your dreams telling you, wake up and go to this place and do this for me. He's not doing that today because that was not his intention. It was always his will to stop that, to stop communicating through visions, to stop communicating through dreams, to stop communicating through various ways, but to communicate to a, a, a through through a written word. Now, when the Hebrew writer wrote this, he was referring to the, his time frame, has in these last days spoken unto us through his son. What had just happened when the Hebrew writer wrote this? Not long after later, but uh, before he wrote this book, what, what has happened in, in A.D. 33? Jesus had died and was buried and resurrected from the dead. And he spoke to his disciples. So in his time frame, he can say that. Has in these last days spoken to us through his son, Jesus. But how does he speak to you and me? Because that's not our time frame. We are in the same dispensation of time, the latter days, or the last days. But he speaks to us in a different way today through the written word. There's a famous TikTok guy, and I think I mentioned this before. Um, what he does he, is he, he, he shows people the simple way of doing something. Right? Sometimes people, we do things in complicated ways, like, like pouring water. And, and this guy in his series of videos, he, he would show uh, how someone is doing something in a difficult way, and then he would show the simple way, and then he goes, you know, hey, do it this way. And one of his famous memes, 
the question was, I want God to talk to me. <laughs> and on the other side, it's a picture of him saying, doing this and the Bible in front of him. This is how he talks to you today. So, so if it's always closed, I'm not hearing from the Father. Right? If it's collecting dust on the shelf, I'm not hearing from my Father. I want him to talk to me. I open the book. Open book. Because the words of this Bible are the words of God. I think this is a good place for us to stop. I appreciate you listening. Uh, Lord willing, when we come back next Wednesday, we will continue from this point and it will catch us up to where we left off covering some new things we haven't touched on concerning transmission of the Bible. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we come before you, Lord. We thank you so much for your word. Thank you, Father, for your patience and your providence in working with your people to bring about the written word. We thank you for the people that pay the ultimate price so that the word can be written, so that the word can be preserved, translated properly, copied properly, and retranslated properly. Father, we're so thankful that the Bible is in English, in a language that we can understand. And we can confidently say today, Lord, that we have come to know you because of your holy word. Help us, Father, to be students of your word, to continue to grow in our knowledge of you and your son, Jesus, in our knowledge of your grace, not only for our own benefit, Lord, but also to equip ourselves in such a way that we can help others see the truth. Father, we thank you so much for this avenue of prayer where we can talk with you, commune with you, where we, where we can give you the glory and honor that is due to your name, where we can thank you for all the goodness that you have shown us, where we can come to find help in the time of need. We thank you so much for the privilege and the blessing of prayer. Father, we continue to pray for the people of Lahaina, and everyone affected in the fires on Maui. Father, there's so much misinformation and things that are happening that are concerning, Lord. We know, Father, that nothing escapes you. And we trust, Father, that you will always judge righteously. But Father, we pray that the people that are in need, they receive the help that they need. And that you use us as your people as well, as your hands and feet to serve those people that are affected by this disaster. We pray for all the first responses, the firemen, the police, government officials, the hospital staff. Be with them, Lord. Pray that we may have leaders that are God-fearing, that would look to you for guidance for the sake of our communities. Be with us, the church, to continue to be the light in the time of darkness. Continue to be your holy nation and your special people to do your will. And forgive us, Father, when we sin and fall short. We pray, Father, for Peggy and her car situation. Pray, Lord, that she can make the 
good decision that will benefit her, and she will find a proper vehicle for her, for herself. I pray also for everyone on our prayer list, Lord. You know their needs. Please, Lord, if it be your will, provide them with what they need as according to your will. Father, we have our own concerns, our personal struggles. Help us. Help us to overcome. Help us to remember to look to you for answers. And purify us by your word. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.